aperture. Hello, uh, good evening. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Michael Famagetti. I'm the editor of Aperture Magazine. For those of you who are not familiar with Aperture, the magazine was founded in 1952 by a group of photographers, artists, writers, and curators to serve as common ground for photography. Aperture today is a multi-platform publisher that unites the photography community in print, in person, and, and online. Uh, tonight, we're very excited to have a conversation about our new issue of the magazine titled Native America, which is guest edited by the, the Red Star. Red Star is a Portland, Oregon-based artist raised on the Crow Reservation in Montana. Her work is informed by both her cultural heritage and her engagement with many forms of creative expression, including photography, sculpture, video, and performance. An avid researcher of archives and historical narratives, Red Star seeks to recast her research, offering new and unexpected perspectives in work that is at once inquisitive, witty, and unsettling. As guest editor, Red Star aimed to create the publication she wished she'd had to read when setting out to become an artist. I was thinking about young Native artists and what would be inspirational and important for them as a roadmap, she notes in the editorial that opens the issue. She continues, the people included here have all played important, an important part in forging pathways, in opening up space in the art world for new ways of seeing and thinking. The roadmap that Red Star created spans a diverse array of intergenerational image making. These include load stars such as the meditative assemblages of Kimawan, Metechwa, the dynamic site-specific installations of Alan Michelson, and the performance-based works of Rebecca Belmore. The issue also includes the stylish self-portraits of Martin Guterres, which appear on our cover, an intervention in a 1995 edition of Aperture Magazine by Dwayne Linklater, and the speculative mythologies of Karen, Miranda, Rivendiera, and Guadalupe Maravilla. Rounding out context throughout the issue are the contributions by distinguished writers and writers, including writingly personal reflections from acclaimed poets, including Natalie Diaz, who, we will, who will be in conversation with Red Star this evening. Uh, Natalie Diaz is a Mojave in Phoenix and an enrolled member of the Gila River Indian tribe. I'm just making sure my connection is okay. Um, her books include When My Brother Was an Aztec and Post-Colonial Love Poem. She has received fellowships from the MacArthur Foundation, Lannan Foundation, United States Artists, and Native Arts and Cultures Foundation. Diaz is director of the Center for Imagination in the Borderland and the Maxine Johnson Learn and Contemporary Poetry at University Tempe. Very privileged to have Diaz here with us tonight. Uh, it has been a real honor to work with Wendy Redstar on this issue of the magazine. Um, at Aperture, we are deeply appreciative of this collaboration. This is no doubt an edition of the magazine that will inform and shape work to come. Although the early concept work for the issue um, began before the shutdown due to the pandemic, this is our first issue of the magazine produced entirely while working remotely. Um, and I want to thank my colleagues, Brendan Emser, Nicole Achimpong, um, who introduced us to the brilliant work of Natalie Diaz, uh, Eli Cohen and Andrea Schlad, um, who did such an amazing work on the production of the issue while working remotely. We can do many things remotely with relative ease, but we are still making a physical object. So thank you, Andrea, for your hard work on the production. Um, and thank you to the team for adapting our process and workflow um, to these um, new conditions. I also wanted to mention that for a limited time, Aperture is offering a discount on subscriptions and single copies of this issue of the magazine. You can use the discount code in the chat to receive 30% off this issue and follow the link to become a subscriber at a discounted rate. 
Um, Aperture is a not-for-profit publication, and so I just wanted to note um, the, uh, in, the individual institutions that support our work. Uh, the issue of the magazine is supported in part by the National Endowment for the Arts, the Henry Luce Foundation, and further generous support is provided by the Philip and Edith Leonian Foundation and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs with the City Council. And significant support for the magazine is provided by the Kanakia Foundation. Thank you to our funders. Um, and just another note that we will be answering questions or taking questions from the audience um, toward the end of the evening. So please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And I also just want to mention that this is the first in a series of programs and conversations connected to this issue of the magazine. We'll be hosting them on Zoom on Thursday nights at seven o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. Um, so please join us next week for a conversation about the work of Cree artist Kimawan uh, Mechua. Uh, and that will be a panel uh, that brings together writer and art historian Christopher Green, the filmmaker Christina Weggs, the artist Will Wilson, who will all discuss uh, Mechua's life and continuing influence on the art world. Um, so now I'm going to pass this off to Wendy Redstar um, to tell us a little bit about her work on the issue. Thank you, Michael. Um, hello, everyone. I just want to um, send positivity to everybody. We're all going through this isolation and pandemic and, and in my case, some of us on the West Coast through fires. And so it's nice just to be able to gather here and um, talk about this uh, bright spot, the issue um, 240 of Aperture Native America. <clears throat> I am um, thinking back, I like dug through my emails uh, to see when I was first approached by Michael and that was July of 2019. So it's been quite a long conversation that we've had getting this started and then um, sort of the big kind of heavy bulk and decision making started during the height of the pandemic. So I am very happy that we were able to produce this uh, beautiful magazine and that everyone who contributed to it, all the artists, the writers, um, everyone who went into um, formatting and creating this issue. Um, it's just uh, really amazing that we were able to all come together and to produce this. Um, some of the, so when Aperture approached me, there were kind of two things that I wanted clarification on. One being um, that I don't have a background in photography. And so I wanted to make sure um, or just let them know, you know, that um, that I'm sort of coming through photography at a different angle, and that uh, that I would be interested also in selecting artists that are also coming to photography in different ways than just uh, classical training in photography. And um, they were totally on board with that. Um, and then uh, the other thing I was really interested in was um, kind of um, thinking about different themes like legacy, language, memory, and land, and uh, selecting artists that were sort of working within those different um, themes and pulling from that direction. So one of the, um, actually one of the very first artists that came to mind was uh, Kimawan. And I had a recently, well, actually, the first time I was introduced to Kim Awan's work uh, was through social media, through Facebook. Uh, when I saw, um, when I was introduced to his uh, Facebook page, um, another photographer, Larry McNeil, who was a friend of Kim Awan, had mentioned something about him. And at that time, Kim Awan had already passed. And so I, um, had the opportunity, his, uh, I don't believe his Facebook page is still live, um, but I had an opportunity to look through his work and then it just really stuck with me. So I'm excited um, for Natalie to speak a little bit further. And before, before we get into Kimawan, I also want to say that Natalie produced a beautiful um, piece of writing called The Picture that was really touching and moving for me to read during the pandemic, um, 
And it's just a really beautiful contribution. So Natalie, I'll go ahead and like pass it on to you to talk about Kimowan. Great. Um, hi, everybody. Um, uh, Ewan Jahotank. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Um, and gracias, uh, Wendy, for uh, creating this uh, space for me to come in and be in conversation with everybody and uh, Michael and the Aperture team um, for, um, you know, offering this space. I think sometimes it's it's not offered much and it should be offered a lot more. So I'm glad to know that these things are happening. Um, I'm coming. Uh, I'm coming to this with no back, uh, background in photography as well. Um, and one of the ways that I've kind of approached the ways that I'll talk about some of, of these things and be in conversation with Wendy is that um, in my Mojave culture, we used to burn our photographs, um, and when someone passed, those would go on the funeral pyre. Um, and so I've always had this recognition of of the power of a photograph and that uh, the peoples and lands, those bodies who are in those photographs um, were not inanimate. They were, they were living, they were a kind of energy. Um, and so that's some of the ways that I'll kind of frame my engagement here. And the work of uh, Kimowan, it was one of the first places in the, in the book that, um, or in the, uh, in the issue that just kind of stopped me. Um, and there are so many places where I felt really emotional as I was looking through the images and I could feel um, some of the physicalities, the emotional physicalities that were present in the work. And uh, similar to, to you, Wendy, um, Kimowan has described uh, their own work and they've called themselves a sculptor, um, which I thought was really beautiful. And so the, um, the writing about Kim Wan's work is called A Kind of Prayer. Uh, it was written by Christopher Green. And um, as Wendy said, in, in 2011, uh, Kim Wan passed on to the next place. And uh, I think I was also struck moving through this work to, to feel at, at once a loss, but also to know that this is the way that they have been present for me in, in these works and these images. One of the quotes that uh, from Kim Wan that uh, was in reference to one of his exhibits without ground. He said, I think North America is a crime scene. And that is so, so powerful um, because in stating that, I believe the images for me, they, they are also subverting what is a crime scene, that projection on what has happened being static and that projection on, you know, native and indigenous bodies and stories that there's a violence and trauma happening. Um, and so in some ways, having read that quote, I think North America is a crime scene, and then to experience the, the disallowing of indigenous bodies, and many times uh, their own body, um, to be subjected to that, uh, I think was is really powerful. Um, one of the, the images I'd like to just spend a small amount of time on is uh, from the Cold Lake series. Um, and the it's the large spread out image, if we can, yeah. Um, this image, to, like, this was one of the images that was most power, like powerful and, and emotional for me. And uh, part of it was also knowing that uh, Kim Wan's mother took this photo. And it's a photo of uh, he and his brother. Um, and so I think, I think this image to me represents a lot of also what uh, Wendy you're you're connecting us to in terms of thinking about land um, you know land language memory and legacy and that's why I felt important to begin with Kimowan um, part of this image is uh, naming uh, Cold Lake and then also beneath it some of the Cree syllabary because language is such an important part of their work and reminding us again that the photograph is not static it's it's moving it's a language it's a kind of communication um, and then the other image i'll just stop on briefly is um the indian hand sign of uh of their hands that are we can pull that up um so kim Wan worked largely in um or 
it, not largely, but uh, often in this, in this particular um, works uh, with Polaroids. And one of the things that they had said, um, thinking about the Polaroid, is few things compare to the silky touch of a newly developed print. And again, back to the, there's so much texture and hands throughout, um, you know, and, and even as it ends, we're ending with Wendy's work, very, the hands are very present. Um, and so, I, you know, thinking about the, these, uh, in, the Indian hand signs, um, and again, this kind of subversion, you know, that, that want to uh, create your own sources of work as a way to kind of subvert the archive, which we can kind of touch on as we move through. Um, but the fact that these hand signals in some ways, again, are, are animating the image. Um, and um, so I, I realize we don't have the image to show you, but um, what they are is there, there's a series of four images in the issue when you get to it. And um, uh, these images, they show a hand. Um, and in some ways that felt very powerful because we know how often native Natives have been posed, you know, we, of course we know Edward Curtis, but all of the many times we've, we've tried to pin down uh, this quote subject of the native and tried to hold them still. And so in so many ways, uh, watching uh, the body happen through Kim Wan's images felt extremely important to me. Um, and this, this way of saying uh, there's, a, there's a public and a private happening. Um, and so we, you know, while we still have the Cold Lake image, um, this relationship between a mother taking a photograph of her two sons, one of whom is an artist who works with photographs, um, and allowing this private space, this intimate space to happen, and then being able to turn that over into a public space that is demanding intimacy still. And that's one of the things that I, I'll just kind of pass back to, to Wendy with is that um, this for me being the opening to this relationship with what's happening throughout the the issue is that um, natives and indigenous peoples are often denied those intimate moments in public because uh, we've we're always told who we are and what we are and so uh, some of what this work's doing and, and very powerfully with with kim wan's work is that uh, it's taking these intimate moments of making and sharing and remembering and being able to turn them over to a public where we still have privacy in that public. And that one feels not only essential, but hopefully dangerous to, uh, to the nation, so. Thank you, Natalie. I, that quote also really resonated me, <laughs> resonated to me. I think North America is a crime scene. Um, that just jumped out uh, at me. And just the way that it, he seems to like grapple with these questions of authenticity and um, the way things are sort of archived native indigenous objects and institutions and really kind of grappling with the institution itself and creating a personal archive and I really became interested in that archive he was creating and sort of the things that he was pointing us towards um, to be really profound. And so that's why it was uncanny then for me to do uh, a research, a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship and find that Kemawan had gifted his artwork to the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, and I had the opportunity to actually see his work in person and to see those uh, Polaroids and also to see like uh, the boxes in which. Uh, he would categorize different things. Um, so that was um, really amazing experience to, to have his work there. And then also for me to do um, research on my own community's objects within the National Museum of American Indian. Um, I originally went there in 2018 to work with Emily Lozami, who is uh, the head archivist at the National Museum of American Indian. And I originally went there to research Upsalaga delegations that had traveled there um, to Washington, D.C. during the turn of the century. And so here's an image of uh, Medicine Crow, who was in a delegation in 1880 that traveled there. And 
what I wanted to do was like find more images of delegations, but also look at uh, objects because NMAI, uh, also the Nat uh, Natural History Museum there, has um, a pretty good collection of uh, Upsalagam material. Um, but what soon happened is I became overwhelmed because <laughs> they had so much within their holdings of Upsalaga photographs and documents and material. And um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about this interview. We could go to the next image here and just really actually focus on this image here at the bottom. Um, so my first day that I did the uh, residency with Emily, she sat me down in this room and they had these binders, like three binders, just of, of Salaga images from different photographers. And I was like a kid in the candy store flipping through and I fell, I found this image and I read the caption and the caption said, Fred Miller, red star, black hair and small medicine tobacco on horseback in front of a teepee, Absalaga Reservation, circa 1898 to 1910. And Red Star is my last name, and Red Star is also my great-grandfather. And Red Star also, to me, sort of means allotments, because it was his generation where our reservation, which used to be uh, owned and held by everybody, was allotted into different parcels. And so Red Star at that time of allotment was the head of the household. So they gave each head of household a certain amount of land. And then his wife and children, they used his name, which all of Salaga just had a name. His name was Red Star as a last name for his wife and his children. And hence, that's how I get Red Star. And I've never seen a picture of Red Star. So I was very excited to see this. Um, and then I started to look into the census records, the date, um, looking at how old Red Star was. And he couldn't be this little boy in the picture. I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear. So Red Star's a little boy and the uh, older man is black hair and the young girl is um, small medicine tobacco. Um, and so I came back to Emily and I said, I don't think this is my great grandfather, but the dates line up with my grandfather, Wallace Red Star Sr. Um, so I called my father and I was mentioning this image and I sent it to him and he was like, oh yeah, that's your grandpa. <laughs> Just really casually, that's your grandpa. And yeah, he said that's him and uh, um, the older man is a crooked face and he didn't remember the girl's name. So then there was this dilemma of the older man now being crooked face. And, and so I, like, I posed this to Emily and told her what had happened. And then I also discovered another copy of this image in the National Anthropological Archives, which has the little boy that is labeled as Red Star as uh, Sydney Black Hair. Um, so these are sort of things that I found within the archive that uh, is sort of like the different labeling, the different copies that are in various collections um, can make things really complicated. And it's also very humbling to, um, to kind of have to open yourself up and sort of re, you know, say either that's my, uh, my grandpa or it's Sydney black hair. And uh, Emily was really helpful in this process. The other thing Emily mentioned too was that, you know, um, you can't just assume like this older man that those are his children. It could have been the photographer saying, hey, this would make a great photo if you could pose with these two children. And those sort of things that um, really didn't, uh, I didn't really think of, you know, as taking things very sort of literally through the photo. So Emily was very helpful in this investigation. And another thing that kept coming up um, through this investigation of these photos is um, linking objects um, to the, the individuals in the photos. Um, so for instance, this image of this older man here named Beartail, he is my uh, great, great grandfather. And there is a, uh, the Smithsonian hired a guy named Will, William Wildshoot um, who lived um, in Bellings, very close to our reservation to do research and acquire objects. And he acquired a lot of medicine bundles. And in the notes, uh, uh, Beartail actually sold several of 
uh, his grandfather's bundles to the museum. And I had the opportunity to see that. So that was really profound and powerful experience um, to work. We can go to the next images here. Um, to see the objects and link them and bring them together. Um, this is the 1880 Crow Peace delegation. Uh, we can go to the next work here. Another thing that came up was um, I found my uh, great great grandma. Her name is Dreams the Truth. And uh, this image that you see on the uh, left here is by Fred Miller. And uh, I knew there was another photographer named Richard Thressel who is images on the right side of my great great grandmother. Um, and so after doing this research, I came home and I had this picture of Dreams the Truth. Um, and I decided to look through Richard Thressel's book, um, photos actually, his collection, his online collection. And I was able to find my grandma again through his, through his image. So it's been a great resource. Um, another profound thing before I move on to the next, our next uh, topic is that um, the experience that I had there at the National Museum of the American Indian was so different from any other institution that I've been to that has crow collections. And that when I was looking at the objects, they allowed me to physically touch them and move them and just be with them. Where I've worked with other institutions where sometimes I, I do get to touch them, but with gloves, or sometimes I don't get to touch them at all. And uh, the collections manager will move them around for me. And the profound thing that uh, they would say to me was like, these are your objects. And um, yeah, that really kind of struck me because I've never had that experience. And they talked about being stewards, stewards of the collection and that the importance of bringing in tribal community members um, to connect with those objects was very important. Um, and so the next person we're gonna talk about, this is my daughter and my dad, um, is Marianne Nicholson. Um, we can move to her. And she is, um, she's such an important person, per important artist, and um, she's a steward. She's a steward for her community and for her community's history. And I'll, um, I'll go ahead and pass this on to Natalie to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, this has been such a generous gift to interact with this work um, and the work as like a comprehensive uh, kind of movement in space. Um, I mean, it was remarkable, Wendy, to, it's almost as if you had us in your living room. I mean, you did, like with your family photos, you know, like that's <laughs> incredible. Um, and, and, you know, again, like there are ways I feel like, uh, the projection and the way that photography has has worked from an American traditional standpoint in relationship to natives or indigenous peoples is that we tend to focus, um, you know, on the dislocation of, of the body from itself so it fits the projection. And, and Marianne Nicholson's work is, uh, it feels so important. And I mean, also the, the, kind, the way that she curated the photographs that are in this uh, part of the issue in this feature, um, and from her personal collection as well as as well as those of her work. Um, so Marianne Nicholson uh, is from the is First Nations from um, the King Kong Inlet in uh, British Columbia, um, from Kwakwaka Wakwa um, peoples. And uh, I'm, I'm beginning, of course, because I'm a poet with a lot of quotes. But uh, there's something that she has said, and you'll find this also in in the feature. Um, that Miranda wrote, there has been a gap in our transmission of our knowledge, and we used photography as a memory device. And that strikes me because, you know, the American memory is so, so vastly different and so much more narrow than, than the Native and Indigenous memory, uh, because it's still happening. It's not something that can be set uh, further back. And just in relationship to these couple images that are here now, I mean, something that, that feels so compelling um, is, is yes, there's a focus on uh, the quote, the human um, and that, but even saying human, I think is, is a very American 
a kind of way of, of thinking about it, um, which is, you know, you can always kind of tell in the way they centered, centered us. And especially because, you know, they, America has never really believed us or treated us as being fully human. And something about these images for me is the power of the land behind the peoples so that you can't uh, extract one from the other so that they are connected. Um, and if we can kind of turn to the next set of images. And so uh, this is a, a really beautiful uh, disruption, it feels like to me, is um, on the left of your screen, and these are from uh, Marianne's personal uh, collections, um, is this image here of, of the couple in what is more of a town or city uh, atmosphere, a, a place where, again, uh, we never want to situate the native in those spaces. And, and to me, this just shows, um, you know, this is, is a very true representation of the ways we inhabit, uh, you know, not just this country, but our lands and, and the places. Um, and something I feel like that uh, Marianne has offered to me in her work is uh, a return to, a return to so many things, but a return to the ideas of abundance. And uh, on the right of the screen, uh, we have some of the reel there and um, of uh, the hooligan fish there. And we have also some, uh, some empty shells that are, are present there. Um, and on those fish racks, um, uh, she had, it was mentioned in the, the feature that um, those hooligan uh, runs, those hooligan fishing runs haven't happened since 2015. And there's something, as she was talking about saying, um, we use photography as a memory device. Uh, and for me, it, it doesn't mean it's situating it back in memory, but it's a device to reactuate or to actuate that memory so that we might return to it in some way. Um, and that felt really powerful with her work. Um, and I don't know if we have an image of, of uh, the, the lighthouse. Um, the, the kind of glass house. Maybe we don't have that. Yeah, yeah, we do. That's, it's, I mean, this is, we're not even in the room with it and you can feel the light of it. You can feel, um, you know, the, the kind of power of it. Um, and something I've been thinking a lot of, about, uh, about this is, um, you know, in, in ways that I'm relating across the, the, the issue and also with uh, Kim Awan's work, but just this, this refusal and this disallowing of space to dislocate us from land. Um, here, here we have like a room within a room. You know, we have um, the, the house within the house and, and there's a way that even the walls have been disrupted. You know, what can dislocate or what can try to contain have been dislocated. And some of the some of the images that are uh, projected onto not only the glass wall but the, the walls of the the actual museum, um, which kind of harkens back to some of Kim Won's work with imagining the museum walls as being ribs of a beast. You know, um, is some of the images are uh, lightning, thunderbirds, rivers. So these uh, these beings, you know, these living beings, the rivers, the thunderbirds, the lightning. That, that hold power for her people. Um, and so to have those projected onto the wall, um, not just the wall of the work and of light, but also the walls outside of, of the museum. So that, uh, I mean, in some ways, this is uh, for me a more powerful telling of, of um, the Christian story of the walls of Jericho. It's like, how do, we, how do we project, how do we power ourselves toward those walls to, uh, to crumble them or to, uh, to somehow diminish the power they think they have over us. And so thinking about this work uh, and how, you know, to imagine the, these walls being, uh, being diminished in some way and being made more powerful in the ways of her people and what a, what a return that is to thinking about the land, to thinking about our connections um, with place, uh, you know, and not just in those, in, in what people call the rural, right? Like, you know, that picture of, of the couple in the city and thinking about uh, the space of indigeneity and the work of indigeneity in the museum. 
um, you know, or the ways, Wendy, that you, you're coming back to touching the objects, you know, to, okay. to uh, returning them to, uh, to your life, to our different lives. Um, this was kind of an incredible work for me to, to really begin to think about, uh, you know, a lot of times we say, I'm going to come in and indigenize this space. And, and to me, I've realized how wrongheaded I've been. <laughs> I, I feel like what she has done, you know, some of the ways that Kimuan talked about uh, the museum uh, or embedding the images in the museum that Duane later went on to, to try to find. But there's a way that, that they've imagined even beyond what a building could hold them to mm -hmm. and hold them within. And to me, that's like, it, that's an energy that resounds and, uh, you know, in the ways that I believe language does with my poetry. And so it was, this is just a really powerful set of images. Um, yeah, and I, I'll turn it, I mean, I feel like I'm, I'm not doing much justice. To it. <laughs> it really is like for me beyond words and it's, it's, it's completely shifted the way I'm imagining uh, what I can be in a space, but also what that space can be. Um, and, and that it's, the space is always indigenous no matter what is trying to hold it still, so. Yeah, um, I, I, I like that she says to create living memories, you know, beyond that moment that a photo can capture. Um, and resources, like really thinking about land and thinking about resources um, and the ex extraction of those resources. And that's something that Dwayne um, thinks about quite a bit in his work. Um, sort of land and resources. And I just want to say like very quickly about Dwayne. I don't know if he's watching, um, but I just wanted to thank him because in 2012 and 2013, I was going through a really rough time and I wasn't making any art. And um, randomly, Dwayne reached out to me and invited me to be a visiting artist at the BAM Center where he was um, teaching uh, a class and I was like I okay I, I don't know this guy but the band center sounds interesting <laughs> and I went there and I met him and um, it reinvigorated me to uh, make art and so I don't think he knows that because I've never told him but I just want to thank him for that but um, just that little act Dwayne is very generous um, and he is always thinking about, I mean, that generosity shows through and that connection with, uh, you know, in connection with Kimowan's work, where, uh, I just wanna pull it up real quick. Here, there's a connection to him and Kimowan's work. So Kimowan did a project uh, at the ICA, I'm trying to find it here. Okay, the Institute of Contemporary Art at the University of Pennsylvania, which was called Without Ground. And he did these photo transfers, Kimowan, where he's sort of looking around um, and investigating. And then um, years later, Dwayne was asked by the ICA, uh, um, to, to have an, a, an exhibition there. And Dwayne asked the ICA, like, what's your history of showing indigenous artists or how many have you shown? And um, they mentioned Kimowan. And so he started looking into Kimowan's project and um, decided that he would try to, uh, the project actually happened in this hallway space. Um, and Dwayne proposed that he would try to like, find Kim Wan's work buried under all these layers of paint. Um, and that's just sort of like the generosity that I find with uh, Dwayne. And it shows up through this body of work that he made, Other Works Will Follow, where he asked me when I approached him about um, producing a, a work for this issue. And he said, um, yeah, I remember Aperture did an issue um, called Strong, Strong Hearts and Native American Visions and Voices in 1995. I want to do something with that. I want to refer back to that. <laughs> and I hadn't even done that homework. I haven't even, I, I didn't even ask Aperture. So just having that sort of 
frame of mind and, and of, uh, reflecting back and paving it forward. Um, it's uh, something that I really appreciate about Dwayne. So he created this um, beautiful folded works and also line drawings um, from the pages of Aperture 139. And the other thing that I, I learned from Dwayne's work is that he does this thing where he, um, he, pr he creates this intimacy with his work and that um, you'll, you'll notice when you look, when we're looking at some of the pictures are covered, some of his line drawings are covered and some are revealed. And so he does this sort of nice thing where you can't see the full image or you can't see the full drawing. And so you're left sort of kind of to wonder um, or just sort of appreciate uh, that you're not going to see <laughs> the whole image or the whole drawing. Um, and so that's a lesson that I feel has been really powerful for me as, as a viewer and also as an artist, that you don't have to reveal or show everything. And sometimes that's not necessary. So I just wanted to say that about Dwayne and also like sort of like kind of pulling the original origin story of the native issue out for us to see. And I think that really links to the next artist we're gonna talk about working with like origins of stories. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I know when we, when we talked before, uh, Wendy, you were, you were telling me a little bit about uh, some of the, the ways Dwayne has talked about knowledge and the idea that, you know, like some knowledges are not for you, you yes. know, or some knowledges are just for me or for us. And, and that feels so important because in some ways that is a, that is a decentering of the idea of knowledge. You know, the fact that there are myriad pathways to, uh, to relating, not necessarily knowing or even understanding, but to relating, um, and that those can shift or return to themselves in so many different ways. Um, and I mean, this this was a real gift to uh, to find Karen's work. Um, I, I feel like I've I've kind of like I'm a thief in some ways that I've arrived uh, to this conversation with you and been given so many gifts that I'm going to run off with, but. Um, this this whole feature was I felt very physically emotional like I felt like I could these images like in my arms and hands and my chest and I think especially uh, considering you know murdered missing indigenous women and, and the ways that so many of our women and not just you know indigenous women and um, but you know our trans and, and queer and non-binary and, and two-spirit peoples and also you know black women and you know, um, you know, Latino women, and, and it's it, the ways that that we often find those of ours who have been missing or murdered in such dislocated ways. You know, dislocated from that connection of of their living body, but also their their bodies of land and, and water. And to me, this uh, to me this this feature and this the sky woman as it's called here is such a return to um the power of femininity and i don't think of femininity as a gendered thing uh i i think of it as a, a certain way of moving and a kind of fluidity and, and definitely a power and a strength um and i think of it as one way of, of being in relation to to the land uh and to those waters and being of those lands and waters and so to to see uh, to see these women's bodies uh, be in touch with and be in touch in relationship with verse and like as a choice, right? Like as as not just a, a choice, but as a, a practice of existing uh, in our lands and in our waters. Um, a lot of this work was done in New Mexico, and I th this feels also like an important part of the relationship of the work. Um, because Karen is from um, Ecuador. And so for me, this also opens up an important way of thinking about indigeneity in that it's not necessarily uh, where you are, but how you practice being there and how you practice that relationship and how important it is to 
to each of us when, when someone comes into our land, we spend so much time trying to receive them and to be able to trust that they know how to move and respect our lands. Um, and so some of these images and, and the idea of, of the nude um, not being something uh, different or an undressing of sorts, but to be again a return to, to a natural state, a natural condition, um, the way that she's working with, uh, with stories, with orality. I, I think there's something so powerful about this, about um, um, this work within the, the, the kind of trajectory or story of the entire issue and that language is so important. You know, it's kind of crazy that, yes, we're talking, of course, to the currency of speaking, but, but language in its many manifestations is, is the pulse of the images, which has been so uh, striking to me throughout. And, and so in some ways, like, I feel like her work is letting the landscape tell its story and also treating the body in some ways as the language of land. You know, we think often about, yes, I am of the land and then I speak a language. And in some ways she's kind of reminded me or returned me to something I didn't know I'd forgotten in that this is, in one way of thinking about how I exist is that I am a manifestation of my land. I am what my land imagined could happen of itself. Um, and that's a kind of story. And so this was just really striking. And again, um, this, this last image, um, what, it, what is the name? I, I don't want to mess up the name of this image. Um, Mud Woman Gazing. Mud Woman. Yeah, it, I mean, for me, like the, this, this image, this woman standing there, you know, to have the, the mud on her body um, among the land and uh, you know as someone who lives in the desert there are ways that I'm always trying to read moisture in the air and things um, but to me that's this is a this image for me is a, a place we have been and also a place that that we have yet to return to so there's there's something that even even the uh, the, the tones of the images um, and move, you know, not uh, not not moving toward color, but moving away towards something that, to me, feels um, it feels like a connection that I don't have the language for, but I'm watching these images be that language, that uh, that orality um, that that we've all been told into existence with. Um, yeah, I get very excited th at thinking about this because <laughs> it, uh, it feels so important to. Um, to me, just as an indigenous woman, um, to see some of these, uh, yeah, so it, it felt very uh, generous to, to be able even to in, engage with these. And with that, I'll, I'll pass back to you. Um, yes, I just want to be mindful of the time here. I, I think that the issue is so rich. Um, each of the artists' work is so, um, just has so many different um, layers to it. <laughs> that I, I wanted to just ask Michael, I know we wanted to leave 10 minutes for discussion, um, that we could possibly start that now. Is there, is there anyone else you wanted to touch on? Do, is there, I don't want to cut you off right in the middle of this brilliant <laughs> conversation. So if you want to keep I mean, going for like a, a little bit and then we can delve into Q and A. Give us a time because I think we could go on for okay. the whole evening. <laughs> so what are we at? A long I, time ago. Yeah, I, I would say go go ten more minutes and then ten more minutes. Do, okay. And then we can do some Q and A. I mean, okay. Yeah, unless unless Emily Stewart tells me otherwise, she's the she's officially in charge. <laughs> okay. That sounds good. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right, ten minutes. I've got my clock on here. Um, yes, that was uh, really. Um, powerful and I had that same reaction Natalie about the land shaping your experience and shaping your language and it makes so much sense to me especially when I think of the Upsalaga language and that um, you know the diff various um, forms in the landscape that we've uh, given names to or had experiences with um, so that was something that I thought was 
um, so important that was brought up within um, that work, Miranda's work. So this is Martin uh, Gutierrez. Um, and again, when I was putting out the sort of um, the list of artists like uh, that I wanted to include, immediately Martin, Martin's work popped in my mind and particularly this project called Indigenous Women. And so there is going to be a program for this work that's happening October 1st with uh, Nadia Rivera um, Fella. And <clears throat> so I was so excited to see this um, body of work uh, that was produced in 2018 called Indigenous Woman, which takes the form of a 124 page fashion magazine. And um, when I, um, so I actually met Mar Martin um, a few years ago. We were on a panel together, and Martin was showing us another body of work that was um, um, these music videos that Martin had made the music, uh, produced the videos, and also starred in the video. <laughs> and I was, I couldn't believe, like, um, it just really blew me away. I, I was like, I want to know this Martine. I want to know this work. I'm like a huge fan. And so I started following Martine's practice. And um, then I saw this project and uh, actually saw a lecture that Martine gave about the magazine. So in this, in this series of work, Martine is um, again, producing the whole, uh, the whole entire magazine, um, the layouts, uh, uh, the, um, fashion, uh, also creating um, fic fictitious uh, characters that are journalists that interview Martine. <laughs> and it just, there's such deep dive to this work. Um, I just wanted to share one of the quotes. Throughout Indigenous women, indigeneity becomes a medium to reflect on gender, gender heritage, and narrative. As a trans artist, Guterres mobilizes the concept of indigeneity to question the birth of origins of gender. What makes native born women, oh, what makes a native born woman and what contributes to the stability of identity? And then there's a quote from Martine saying, affirming my life is an ongoing project. It's about identity at large. And <clears throat> that statement is, um, I, I, I think about that and I think about these sort of different uh, boxes that society places people within or like even us going back and forth like with indigenous or I'll say native or aboriginal and all these sort of terms that we've sort of kind of uh, can sometimes get locked into or we're trying to escape from or grapple with or um, even the even uh, jumping back to Kimawan with authenticity <laughs> or stereotype. And um, I just found this work to be incredibly empowering uh, because Martine says, no one was going to put me on the cover of a Paris fashion magazine. So I thought I'm gonna make my own. <laughs> and um, yeah, so Mar Martine, um, I, I just found uh, the work to be powerful. And then the cover, the cover for this issue to introduce this issue was, um, how could you not pick up this magazine and want to look and investigate it more? Um, so yeah, just really powerful work. And I'll I'll um I'll go ahead and pass it over to you, Natalie. Yeah, I mean, even I've yeah. I've been staring at the issue for so long, and I'm even like seeing it again for here is almost like seeing it the first time again. <laughs> images. Um, so this was one of the images I, I just want to make sure we touch on before we shift over. Um, okay. And uh, here titled as Crow Hands, Crow Objects. And uh, you know, this being your work, of course, uh, Wendy. And I feel like we've touched, we've touched on so many of these relationships that are, um, that are right now kind of moving through and around the image that's on the screen um, with, with your hands and these, um, um, 
you know, I, I even hesitate to think of them as objects. Like I feel like in some way they're, they're extensions. And of course, when they're in your hands, they are extensions of your hands and they were made by someone. So they mm -hmm. are like extensions of other, other peoples that, that are there. And, and just the image itself to me is, it's almost like it's completely shattered time and stepped out of it. It's again, it's that relationship and that return and it's, it's memory, it's memory actuated is a way I, I feel like it, it doesn't mean that we, we actually have to know that it was forgotten, but we can enter into it. Um, and, and I, I'm thinking back to Marianne's work. I'm thinking, you know, to, to Dwayne, to, uh, you know, Kim Wan, like the, the way, the way that the museum doesn't have the ultimate power in this moment, you know, and, and you had said that they're like, well, you know, what was it you said? These are yours? Did they tell you? Yeah, well, these are yours. Yeah, and and even and that is even an interesting phrase, right? Like for them to say like uh, these are yours, like again, an iteration or reiteration of a kind of like property. But yes, as soon yeah. as you touch them, like like sometimes the thing about saying like you know this is mine is is really the connection of saying I am of you mm -hmm. and I am yours, and I think that's something that is hard for American minds to understand about uh, some of the ways indigenous uh, peoples think about family and relationship. Um, and so this image for me is very much tied to uh, the images of, of um, you and your daughter at, mm -hmm. you know, taken at, at, across time. Um, like, I feel like that's, uh, and uh, so your daughter's, you know, Beatrice, Yes. Um, I want to make sure I say it. <laughs> this, this image to me is just incredible. And, and this is like the real power. And this goes back to, I think, what Marianne was saying. It's like, this is this memory. It's not just memory, right? It's, it's moving. It's in motion. Um, and the, the last one I want to just make sure I touch on, because to me, this is, uh, this is also very much about how we exist without time, um, is the, the, the project, um, the, the exhibit, the work of the maniacs. We're not the best, but we're better than the rest of, um, of your father's rock band. And um, like that, that project that is, uh, is referenced there to me is, it's so incredible because it's also, yes, it's an acknowledgement to family, but I think something that's, that you've pulled together here in this entire issue, um, that I'll just add right now is that the indigenous lexicon is beneath everything, every language, every uh, story in, in America, in the United States. And I think the ways that you've shown some of those connections and, and just, and, sh and kind of shown that, that whatever is indigenous, you know, and that was a question Kim Wong was asking, what makes an Indian an Indian? Yes. That it's unpinnable. Like you, you can't pin it down and it's also capable of shifting. So as much as America has in some ways tried to hold us down, we continually break it. We continually break it, make it better even when it doesn't realize that that's what's happening. Um, and uh, that, that work across the generations for me just feels so, uh, so important. Um, yeah, so I know I know we're short on time. I could talk forever. About it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so we'll I'll shift back over. Thank, uh, thank you. I, um, I mean, it's great. It's I think it's a gift just to have your insight um, on my work and some of the points that you brought up. And intergeneration is really important to me, and I actually see that within uh, even your writing, <laughs> the sort of intergeneration being you know passed from one to the next and so that's something i'm just really yearning for that so actually being able to hold those objects it, it's a um, it's like a surreal moment for me and they weigh really heavy in my hands mm -hmm. and and what am i going to do you know it's, uh, and that is try as hard as i can to pass that knowledge forward and so that's why I also feel like I'll say just briefly about Rebecca Belmore and her work and how pivotal it is. And Aperture asked me like, who, who is sort of like the, the 
a sort of, sort of pillar, a pillar that you would talk about in contemporary Native art. And it, for me, it's always been Rebecca Belmore. And um, one of her works that's not included in here, but an early memory of her work is speaking to their mothers. It was this giant megaphone that she um, made and then um, she set it out in the landscape around Banff, the Banff Center. And she and uh, other native artists and activists um, talked to the land. And that was so powerful. And I saw her work when I was in graduate school. And that's one of the first contemporary native artists that I actually saw out there um, that I could really connect to um, as, a, as a native artist and as a woman. Um, and then another really important work that is brought up in, in the issue um, are these sort of, um, well, I'll just state this real quick because I want to get to the questions. But um, after reading this article, I was really amazed in her, her collaboration. So with th these particular works that are on the screen right now, um, she's reflecting back onto her uh, performances that she made and picking out moments in that performance and then collaborating with her sister to uh, sort of redo those photos and then also working with a photographer and sort of staging this whole thing. And to me, that really is um, a sort of a dimensional way of like re-encountering your work and rethinking about your work. And so that really stuck out to me in, in this work. But I just want to say that she's a very important artist and I was thrilled to have her included um, in, the, in this issue. Should we take some questions then? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so here's one question that I think relates back to Natalie's point about not being able to pin down indigeneity. Um, somebody's asking how, if you could talk about Wendy, how you chose the artist in the magazine and they're noting just the breadth of work and just the kind of broad range of practices at play. Um, because I think there are so many distinct visual languages at play. Mm -hmm. It's almost like everybody has like such a singular practice. So maybe you could just talk a little bit. <laughs> I think that's exactly what I was going for. Um, um, people who are really pushing, utilizing images in the photographic medium. And so that's kind of what came to mind. It's like, who do I know? Um, in the, in the community that is um, sort of really pushing the boundaries of photography. And so I think they all, all of the artists and um, even the writers that we asked to sort of mine their own archives and, and write about images in their family's archives, that was sort of the motivation. It's like, how can we really kind of um, push, the, push the photo and um, push the medium? And maybe you could talk, you started to touch on uh, Richard Throssell, um, but you yes. the Horace Pulau. <laughs> I wonder if you could talk about, because they, they do stand out as contributions in the issue that I think they're, I mean, obviously they're ones from kind of early 20th century and the others from mid-century, but they're probably, I think they're the only examples of kind of almost just straightforward photography, kind of, um, you know, almost coming more out of a documentary sort of tradition. And I wonder if you could just talk about their work and their kind of relationships vis-a-vis -vis the communities that they photographed. Yeah, I was attracted to their work because of the, um, just sort of what they were grappling with at the time that they were producing their photos. And I, I thought they were both really great snapshots of um, great, great changes within uh, Native communities. And Richard Thrussell, I have a very soft spot because he photographed my community and he was Cree and half Scottish and uh, worked for the um, government and um, photographed with that kind of um, behind him and then switched over to his own like photo studio and eventually was adopted by my tribe. Um, and I've always loved his images because he photographed so many Crow women. 
and a lot of the other photographers that photographed the crow they really didn't uh, photograph women quite like he did and Horace I just think his images it's that gray area that I love so much <laughs> you know where it's a uh, where um, you're seeing uh, his community um, participating in their culture but also grappling with like uh, dominant culture and that's both both of those photographers do that in such an interesting way and not in a staged way at all mm -hmm. um, so um, that's why I I was like we have to have these two uh, here's another question um, Wendy why was it important to include not only artists but also poets and writers such as Natalie David um, David Troyer, Tommy Pico in the issue. Because we're, you know, talking, we're, you, photos are about stories <laughs> and telling stories. And so I really love this idea. And I can't write to save my life. <laughs> you know, it's like torture. And so to, even to like sit here with Natalie and hear her speak about these images that's so important and these different artists and their work. Um, and her just talking about my work, I feel like I've learned so much. So just um, to crossing those conversations across mediums um, is very, it's really valuable. So yeah, storytelling. Well, this is a related question. Um, how do you see, or how do you both see these photographs within the issue functioning? Are they images? Are they objects? Are they sculptures? Are they residues? Are they something else entirely? I'm gonna punt that over to <laughs> no, pass it, basketball. Pass it over to Natalie. <laughs> I mean, I think there are there are all those things and and more. And again, like I'll, I'll return to that word of like being unpinnable. You know, um, for a long time, the I think the photograph was intended to hold something still or to mark a moment, whereas things are in continual motion. You know, nothing. Even if something is still, it, there's still energy and movement in it and so you know and i think it it's exactly what wendy said that they're stories and they started a long time ago and and they're going to keep telling themselves um even if even if you don't see the image like now i've seen the image and i leave and that story is in me somehow um and it you know there are ways that it that it carries um and i mean i think they're texts you know uh i think they're extensions of the body and that's um yeah, that's really powerful. But there is just so much language and like, this is a poetic issue, it's, it's beautiful. Um, one other question asks about um, that you both noted not having a background in photography and how um, that might open up a space for subversion or critique um, and that maybe the lack of background creates a kind of collaboration or community. Um, maybe i mean wendy i always felt like you were a little bit um maybe modest about how much you act you know about photography um and you know just through your own practice and also through your extensive research um and you know the way you navigate through archives um but um but I do think, um, I think that was one of the assets. I don't want to answer the question, but just having worked with you on this issue, I felt like your kind of capaciousness in thinking about images is a really an asset, that it wasn't tethered to one kind of tradition. And actually, it was, in fact, trying to kind of move away from or disrupt a certain kind of tradition. Um, but I don't know if you wanted to answer that question as well. Um, yeah, I just... Um... Number one, I always feel so honored. I, I mean, I've been invited to be like a keynote speaker at photography conventions. And so I think I'm grappling a little bit with imposter syndrome and, and more so about like the technical aspects. Like it's, you would be embarrassed if I got my camera out and I, I just fiddle with the buttons and then push, <laughs> like hopefully it works out and usually it does. So I guess I, when I'm saying, that it's more about the technical aspect, but I've always been in love with images ever since I was a child. Um, and I've always had that attraction towards them. And uh, from the very start of my art practice, it was an image that um, 
helped me create the first work. Um, so, so I think um, in, in that way, Michael, you're correct. Like, I, I, think, I think I've ha always um, utilized images and photography 100% in my practice. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's something kind of nice about feeling kind of on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> like I can get a, a little bit away from the criticism if I'm like, but I, I'm not trained in photography. <laughs> you can cut me a break, but yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. I think it's good to have a little bit of perspective from the outside. How, how about you, Natalie? I mean, I, I guess the one thing I'm thinking is, is that you were talking about how early you were drawn to, you know, images and, and I think some of that, from my experience is also wanting to see yourself and wanting to see yourself the way you were or that you wanted to be or knew you could be somehow. Um, and again, especially my community not hanging on to photos. I mean, we do now, but, but my elders and my, um, you know, they, there weren't a lot of photos around. Um, and so I think there's something about that uh, relationship. Again, I keep thinking about the ways that Marianne talked about the image uh, as being a way of remembering mm -hmm. um, and not memorial, but remembering as in still happening, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. That, yeah. Um, to, to hear you talk about um, the burning of the images is really powerful. Um, and that link, I think too, like with Marianne saying like, it's in the body. Let, let, let's have this be those moments just let's have them be in the body of taking that knowledge that that photo has well i think we're actually just about out of time and i think this um theme that we're on of withholding the image is actually a nice note to end on um so i want to thank you both wendy and natalie for that rich and provocative conversation um we could happily listen to you all night um but we will have um more conversations around this issue of the magazine again um, next Thursday night. And I encourage everyone who's um, tuned in, I don't know what we call it, on Zoom, um, just to look at the Aperture calendar. And um, it's on our website. And you can see all the programming that we have connected to the issue. Um, so thank you again, Wendy. And thank you again, Natalie. Um, that was really, really brilliant. So appreciate thank it so much. Gracias. It's yeah. been lucky to be with you all. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, thank you to you, Michael, and to Brendan. I kind of miss having our phone calls all the time. <laughs> next project, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Take care. Good night, everyone. Okay. Thank you Goodbye. again.